appeals to an old demographic, and that just happens to be the bulging demographic in the country. And partly also, um, this is my theory, based on no evidence whatsoever, uh, partly also because the cacophony around journalism and people coming up and writing stuff and shouting at each other via social media or on Twitter and having ridiculous spats um, and saying stuff and then finding out it isn't true. In, amid that cacophony, more value is being placed by a lot of people on a trusted brand that gives it to you straight, that doesn't shout at you, but kind of just presents it in a fairly straight, impartial way. And so my, my view about journalism is that the old media will survive longer than people think. And even when it dies, there is going to be a place for journalism. And there is going to be a place for the curation of that journalism, for people to kind of guide you through it. Now, I don't think we know what the world is going to look like. I don't know whether it's going to be a Radio 4 in 25 years' time or whether it'll be news programmes with the running order, or whether it'll be what we call newspapers that have a front page and a features page and a, a sports page. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I think that that role of, if you like, piecing together the news and giving it some shape uh, is actually going to be a valued, is going to be a valued economic activity for quite a while. I think that you and I will want someone to tell them this is a big story, this is not such a big story, this is a fun story, and we're not just going to want to pick and choose random stories that are sort of thrown at us in the, you know, out of the mobile phone. And maybe it'll be some of you guys here today. Your turn to ask the questions now. We've got a couple of mics, so just put your hand up if you want to ask a question and we'll get a mic to you. Um, so I'm just wondering, because I, well, oh, hi. I'm sorry. So like, there's like always news all the time. Like, I'm just wondering how do you guys like stay on top of the news and then keep your audience like engaging with the current news? It does seem to be. I mean, I have this problem. There's an overwhelming amount of information. The worst thing about the job. I know. And so, so, you know, in the olden days, if you'd do a TV program or you'd go on the radio and you'd wait until reviews the next day. Now, even while you're on air, you sit there on your phone on Twitter. What are people saying about this? What are people saying about the program? What do they think? And there's information out there all the time. I know you, on a Sunday, I sort of think I should probably read the papers, watch the Andrew Marr show, now watch the Robert Beston show, and then there's the. Dermot Murnaghan one and the world of this weekend. <laughs> I've just got more to do with my life, to be absolutely honest. <laughs> <laughs> so so how do you stay there. across everything? Because you need to in your job, so I suppose you have to choose. You, you, just, you just read a lot, basically. I'm in a new graze, I find. I don't know about you guys. I just graze quite a lot. I, 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 I mean, I have turned into a very superficial being to some extent. <laughs> <laughs> Constantly just scrolling through stuff and... and, and, and not really reading to the end, and then hopefully finding a few things that I do read and become a bit more, a bit more sort of really seriously engaged with. I think um, listen, listen. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think listening to what your friends, listening and seeing what your friends are interested in, is actually more useful now than trying to stay uh, on top of that wave of, of, of constant news. You will drive yourself mental. I mean, I, I do. I don't know about you, Tina, but I do before I go to bed have a ritual stupidly because then it makes you awake and you can't sleep of looking through the headlines and looking at Twitter and stuff and then I do it again when I wake up and, and sort of hope, hope that I'm still on top of things but I do think increasingly especially if you're younger than me um, what your friends are sharing is is probably where it's at what they're interested in talking about but it's you know, I, I bump into most interesting stuff now through through people sharing it on Facebook or yeah. Yeah. There are also so many more platforms now because before it might have been just Facebook. Now in the morning, I might have to look at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. I just, and that's I before just, you I even think, get to the news. I think just just treat Snapchat as you know, it's just just treat it. Some things I think that just funny and off kilter, and there's no real time pressing on you. And then treat Facebook as a thing where there's a sort of marketplace feeling of, of, of content, and that you know you can't you can't do all that. And you, you just won't have time. But I think from like a journalism point of view, like everyone here. To, to some extent, the, the programmes or the websites that they work on kind of take the news and then go and do what was traditionally thought of as features, right? They like take the news and then they go, okay, so what is the next part of this story and do a certain degree of agenda setting, certainly in investigations and on the current affairs show and like at Vice, 
we've almost like flipped, like the front page of Vice is more like a feature section of a newspaper and the news section is kind of, do you know what I mean? And I think that that is the, like sometimes the best way to stay on top of a news cycle is to like pick out the bits you want to do and then, and then sort of agenda set yourself. And I think that that, because there are so many websites doing rolling news and so many outlets doing rolling news, often the best way is to say, we're not going to cover every story. And, and then work out good ways to cover the stories that you choose. Yeah, I think that's true. Although I'm actually probably a little bit old-fashioned in this, and, uh, but I'm not as gloomy as most people are about the future of traditional media. And I do think there's a role for that kind of still, steady place in the middle of this media maelstrom, which just tells you, like, these are the, these are the big stories of the day, this is your briefing, this, this is what you need to know. So personally, I listen to the Today programme every morning, and I get the kind of, you know, the big stories of the day from that, and then and what the commentators are saying about it, what the politicians are saying that day, and then I will read one national paper, um, and I do buy the kind of dead tree paper and like read it, because I'm just like, if I've done that, I have a briefing on the kind of basic news of the day, like nothing would have escaped me, and then I will just kind of graze and digest what comes in on Facebook and Twitter and what people are chattering about, and you know, what I'm seeing on various other kinds of social <coughs> networks, but I actually think there is a role for the traditional media in just kind of in just telling you, this is your briefing, these are the six stories you really need to know about today. And I kind of think that that will survive in some form. Okay, more questions? Do you have a table from there? Just go on. <laughs> Hello, um, so I'm news editor of my university paper. A while back um, I popped an article online, it was a bit of a silly one, about a tree falling down on campus. It was full of pottons and basically it was turned into a bench. Now that ended up getting um, more likes and shares of retweets than some of the longer investigations that we've done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the world. <laughs> <laughs> so basically my question is, being more interested in kind of long form journalism myself um, and seeing the success of that compared to some other pieces, I'm wondering how can you kind of guard against clickbait and make these longer form pieces still relevant to people and just as interesting? Joy. Some stories just matter because they matter, and I think I think it's just a it's a sad fact of life that a kind of long form investigative journalism that you know say that I do is just not going to get the same kind of audience as as a the tree the tree the tree. Bench, or the cat in the tree or like Disney princesses or whatever else we're doing on our site, and that's always just, it's just always been the case. Like you know, in the same way as enter because that stuff is basically entertainment content, and entertainment has always been bigger business than news. You know, EastEnders has always got a bigger audience than the 10 o'clock news, it's just the way it is. And so, I think... Uh, yeah. Especially this week. Especially <laughs> this week. So it's really a problem for the people who are editing the collection, because what they need to make sure they have is they've got the long form that gives people, if you like, a, a reason to buy the thing. And they also need to have the story about the cat falling out of the tree um, in order to actually make people buy the thing. And so, I mean, good products will be a mix. It's not that one, you know, vital and one is rubbish. It's not that one is, um, you know, we, we wouldn't really want it to be there, but we put it there because we, we have to. Basically, a good product will be a mix of lots of different kinds of journalism, lots of different kinds of stories, and will have, you know, appeal to all sorts of different pieces of us. Each of us has a taste for funny stories, and a taste for sad stories, and a taste for serious stories. And a good newspaper, a good radio programme, a good TV programme, and a good website will have a big mix of all of those things. And that comes back to the point about curation being a value. It, but the, the, there's value in each of those items, but there's also value in collecting them together and putting them into a package. And, um, you know, a good package will have a lot of, a lot of different stuff in I also think, really quickly, it is like changing quite a lot. I remember a period, maybe two years ago, where you would go to morning meetings and see your best stories each day and it was always sort of sex and drugs and that kind of thing and some of, like you say, some bigger investigations and that to me has changed so quickly in the last two years that now more often than not it's like 2,000 plus word articles that are more investigative stuff, the stuff where we're breaking stories that performs best and stuff that, you know, people have done thinking, oh, this will do well. Actually, people are kind of over it. I don't know if maybe there's, you know, people have just read everything they want to read about like weird sex stories and they're just over it now. Um, but I have been so encouraged and infused and it's really good for morale I think at a news publication when you kind of come in each morning and see that the stuff that you worked hardest on is the stuff that's doing best and, and that's been my experience 
of advice in the last year, especially. I'd back that up and I'd say, I mean, recent experience, you know, a page about Harry Styles' new slightly shorter hair <laughs> shot to the top of most read for us this week. And a story last week we did about, um, we'd followed for three months uh, a guy, a young a teenager, uh, with anorexia and sort of explaining what it was like being a boy in a girl's world, a girl's world in very commas. You know, and, and it's, it's obviously a bit galling to see Harry's hair zoom ahead of it. But, you know, I kind of, this is probably a really rubbish analogy, but if you set up a, a stall in, in the street, like an ice cream van selling 99s and then another ice cream van selling bunches of broccoli, the initial rush would probably be to the ice cream van, right? Not to the broccoli van. But in the end, the broccoli will fuel <laughs> you and give you more nutrition. And in the end, most humans will go, do you know what? If I had to do it every day for my life, I'd probably go for the broccoli van because it's going to keep me alive. So I think in the end, don't worry about the initial rush. Just enjoy it. it you know, the piece about the, the bench, you know, probably took you like a fraction of the time. Just enjoy <laughs> seeing that, that Harry's hair took five minutes. See the traffic rolling and go, oh, well, there we go. And then get back to the stuff you care about. You can do both. And it's, you're not kind of compromising your, your values by doing both. I think we've only got time for one more question, I'm afraid. Hello. Um, I have a question for Sam and Heidi. Uh, so you both do articles and content which uh, involves investigations and issues in other countries. Uh, sometimes those countries, the media channels in those countries are not that honest, confident and clear about those issues as you guys actually cover. And I personally like know some situations, I'm Turkish and there has been some issues like a couple of years ago, demonstrations and we actually, all my friends who speak English and everything, we followed it from Weiss from BBC and everything. Um, do you feel that kind of responsibility or any pressure on like um, when you actually investigate something, it actually impacts more than the country you publish it in and it kind of spreads to all these other people who kind of read it and like you're the voice of many people. So I suppose it's having your stories, having that global reach. Yeah, I think with Vice in particular, many more than a lot of other companies is that we have offices all over the world so we're not just you know taking stories like you have a correspondent in a different country but we also are making those stories available and translating them and have editors based on the ground you know in all over i mean the uk is probably vice is like fourth biggest place after germany and america and canada and so, and, but we have, you know, an office in China and in Turkey and all over and actually, you know, one of our journalists was in prison for a while covering uh, protests in, in Turkey and is out now. But I think, um, again, there's just a huge appetite for it if you, you know, make those, you know, get those stories across in the right way. And I think that from the beginning, we've just found that there's no, that there isn't a barrier to, I'm only interested in the story that's sort of on the end of my street. Um, and obviously it's important and we, you know, we, we take that duty to the country where we're reporting in to report those stories as accurately as possible and we don't want to just sort of bother with Jane and, you know, like I think that sometimes that's a bit of a misconception about bias anyway that we just like show up at some place with our safari hats and go, what's going on here? Um, and you know, we do have that duty, but I think the way that you fulfill that duty is by making it available to readers in that country and having their input and that has normally been very positive. And you know, the BBC obviously you know, has all its world channels and you're doing that all the time as well. And I think that that is kind of the, the litmus test of, of when you're reporting on other countries. I think in a minute we'll get our panellists to give us just some tweetable show of advice. So if you can have a think about some tips or maybe a mantra. 140 <coughs> characters ideally, that would be great. In the meantime, Anna, we're going to hear from your former colleague, John Snow, who's got some journalism advice to share. Hi, I'm John Snow and, uh, well, about all, I'm going to have to say well done to you for making it to the Radio 1 Academy in Exeter. This could be the start of a, a long and a very successful time in journalism. I wish I'd had the opportunity you're having because I might have been some good if I had. <laughs> journalism is an experiential thing. You, know? you, don't, you can't be taught it. You have to pick it up as you go along you, from the experiences that you have. I mean, obviously all that editing and the rest of it, but you pick that up in three weeks. Three weeks. The real thing takes the rest of your life. I'm still learning now. Being inquisitive. Write nicely. Your writing is so important. I mean, you know, you're 
And look at what you're seeing. You are seeing something the viewer desperately wants to see but can't. You are their eyes and ears. So you really have to have to write from the absolute bottom of your heart. Don't just chuck it onto the onto the computer and hope it all makes sense. Um, that's one tip. Two, don't get drunk. Um, that's obvious. Um, enjoy it. It's amazing fun. I mean, fancy being paid for it. Have a great time. Cheers. Bye bye. Don't get drunk. You're often, <laughs> you're often not paid for it, by the way, which is a problem. <laughs> Don't do that for too long. Um, your advice? Okay, my advice is, and uh, I'm just coming back to the theme I've, I've, I've banged on about already, and my advice is make yourself an expert in something. Because make, is that less than, that, that's that's less than 140? 140, yeah. But the but, reason is, is yeah. that there are a lot of people who generically want to go into journalism. And the absolute key is to have some distinctive capability, some distinctive sell selling point. The USP is the kind of business phrase, unique selling point. And I, I think that means making yourself an expert in something. Preferably not, I mean, unless you're really good at it, something that everybody else wants to be an expert in, like showbiz or music or whatever. Um, if you can be an expert in something, you've got the start of a, a, a career there. I think that's a Facebook post. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, two things I think. Um, in terms of surviving in a newsroom, um, a colleague of mine, the, the Telegraph, um, once said to me, don't complain, don't explain. Um, and what he meant Kate was... Kate also famously said that. Oh, did he? Yes. Or maybe that's where he got it from. Um, plagiarism. Um, but yeah, so he, he was just like, you know, look, just come in in the morning and just do everything with a big smile on your face, never complain, however you know, awful the job is, just do it with a big smile, but also, if you screw something up or you're late or whatever, don't go and make excuses and grovel. Just get on with it and just don't do it again. And you know, just basically get on with the job with a big smile. But don't complain, don't explain. And the other thing I would say is, whatever your ambition is, just scale it up, uh, not down. Because I think that people often kind of limit themselves and they think this is a difficult industry, I can't do this. And the projects that we're taking on are big and ambitious and daunting, but actually it's honestly amazing what you can do if you set your cap at it. So just take whatever your original idea was, Blow it up and think, how big could I make this? How like how high could I aim? And then go for it, and um, you know, and you'll win. Sam, mine would just be start with stories. By which I mean, there's a lot of journalism or things on journalism websites now that are think pieces and personal essays and all of this kind of thing, which is like. Which is great, I'm not against it, some of it has been incredibly illuminating and has changed the way we think about lots of subjects, but I think when you're getting into journalism, the best thing you can do is start with stories, you know, if it's something in your life, something in your local area, something that you might know because you're younger than most people working in newsrooms, that is the best route in, it's what journalists are looking for from, from new journalists, you're not going to write the best essay on the Kanye West album, probably. So start with something that you already have, the asset that you already have, which is the stories you know about, you know, in your area from, from your from your life. And I think that is always a good way in. You beat them all, haven't you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, Anna. Probably the final thing that sort of to add to those obviously sensible bits of advice is for me, think about why you personally share things. What made you share that particular headline? and apply that when you write stuff. Because we all tend to start off thinking, this is news because it's news, and that's because it's news. <laughs> but think about actually why you would share it, who you want to share it, why it's gonna be something that people wanna pass on. It's kind of like that quality. Think about that, and then apply that every time. You know, obviously the story itself matters more how, how you've got it, but once you've got it, how are you gonna make it that thing that people really want to tell their friends about? And if you get that right, you're winning. And the only thing I'd add to that is, reputation is everything. Be nice to people on the way up. This is a small industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you want to share that tweetable advice, some of it's tweetable, use the hashtag R1 Academy. I think there are lots more sessions going on today. If you've still got questions for the panel, they will be in the Hangout, so you can harass them there. And uh, I think Grimmy's doing a social media <coughs> session a little bit later this afternoon, and there's also a chance to win big weekend tickets if you haven't got them already. So good luck to all of you here, and a huge thank you to our panel for joining us in Exeter.